What's up, beautiful people? It's Caden with Urban Finance. Today, we're going to be doing a brief review of The $40 Million Slave by William C. Roden. But before we jump into that, make sure you smash the like button and subscribe to the page for more amazing content. Why are today's athletes so lost? The answer lies in the fact that they have lost their mission. Historically, black athletes have always had a connection with the larger African-American community, a sense of the legacy of struggle that made possible this generation phenomenal material success. This sense of mission has been a cornerstone of African-American survival, a source of strength and inspiration. Black athletes have symbolically carried the weight of a race eternal burden of proof. Their performance was among the most viable evidence that black, as the communities were enough, smart enough, strong enough, brave enough, indeed human enough to share in the fruits of this nation with full citizenship and humanity. And if black people were to be given the same fair shot that many black athletes do, then they will also dominate any industry that America has to offer. Unfortunately today, many black athletes have little or no sense of who or what came before. There is no sense of mission, no sense of the athletes as part of a larger community, as a foot soldier in a larger struggle. Black athletes of an earlier era were forced by upbringing and circumstances to see themselves as part of a national community. This is no longer the case. Ignorance of the past makes it difficult for black athletes today to unite and confront the issues of the present. Today, when the black athlete, while potentially more powerful than ever, has the least drive to do more for their community in comparison to any other time in history. While now they occupy a position where they can be more than a mere symbol of black achievement, where they can actually serve their community in vital and tangible ways, while also addressing the power imbalance within their own industry from a position of greater strength, they lack purpose and drive. They stand as living active proof that it does not necessarily follow that if you make a man rich, you make him free. Sports on the plantation were used as a diversion to dull the revolutionary instinct. Many slaveholders felt that contests such as the Harvest Festival Festival, and early American form of athletic games were an ideal way for slaves to safely take out suppressed anger, aggression, and hostility. They felt that the competition dulled the revolutionary inclination. Frederick Douglass agreed. Douglass did not like fets and festivals and was generally suspicious of sports. Douglass felt that such festivals were only safety valves and conductors to carry off the explosive elements inseparable from the human mind when reduced to the condition of slavery. But for these sports, the rigor of bondage would have become so severe for endurance that the slave would have been forced to dangerous desperations. While plantations owners needed slaves to participate in sports to sometimes win money for them, such as when they made them fight other slaves, they were also keenly aware of the dangerous nature of allowing slaves to come together, especially in a team-like manner. This is one of the reasons that in 1797, the city of Fayetteville, North Carolina, passed a law prohibiting prohibiting African Americans from playing baseball on Sundays. This early history of the African in America offers a first glimpse of the difference in sports culture between African Americans and European Americans. The Jockey Syndrome There was a time when during horse racing, you would primarily see black jockeys. One of the best ones was Isaac Murphy, and one of his most challenging races was against the White Hope Garrison. The big race was in 1890, and Murphy won this race, which gave him even more fame and wealth. Many of the best black jockeys, like their professional basketball counterparts today, earn salaries and enjoy notoriety unthinkable to fellow African Americans, particularly in the South. What would Murphy have said if someone had told him, as he basked in the flow of his Coney Island success, that black jockeys were racing towards extinction? If the response of contemporary black athletes is any indication, he probably would have laughed in his questioner's face. During the interview for this book, black athletes routinely said without hesitation that they thought the likelihood of such a black vanishing act was virtually impossible. The black presence in contemporary sports has become so well defined, so deeply entrenched over the past 50 years that many fans, both black and white, as well as players feel that the current situation always was and always will be. Even as the NBA actively grooms as many non-black players as it can, players from Europe or Asia players who don't bring along with them all the street baggage of black stars. Grand Hill sees this idea as preposterous. People are too used to seeing the game played at a certain level, Hill said. The league needs us. That's what Isaac Murphy also thought. Within 20 years of Murphy's defining victory, the black jockey have all but disappeared. It wasn't because black jockeys grew too physically big or because of an exodus 
exodus from the sports or from an exodus from the south to the promised land in the north or because blacks gravitated to more prestigious occupation. African American jockeys disappeared because of confluences of powerful forces, owners, and trainers who stopped hiring them. White jockeys ganged up on them and the jockey clubs systematically denied the reenlisting of blacks. Black riders became victims of the jockey syndrome or changing the rule to fit the need, the need to maintain control in a face of a perceived challenge to white supremacy. The jockey syndrome is distinguished by a changing of the rules of the game when competition began to gain ground. It usually involves a series of maneuvers to facilitate racist outcomes, including the taking away of previously granted rights and the diluting of access through coercive power and force, a phenomenon that was common outside of sports as well. Black Americans would see that clearly when the Civil Rights Act they celebrated in 1875 was almost completely overturned by Plessy v. Ferguson case of 1896. The jockey syndrome has been the primary mechanism in American sports for tilting the seemingly level playing field of sports away from equal opportunity and towards white supremacy. In short, the conspicuous success of black jockeys led to their demise. Just as black jockeys fail to organize and accumulate an ownership stake in their industry, contemporary black athletes have little ownership stake and thus are vulnerable to the same jockey syndrome. Arthur Rube Foster sought to redefine, celebrate, and make sense of the African-American presence in the United States. He started the National Negro League, the NNL, in 1920 for black baseball players. This was because they weren't allowed to play in the white games, and this was the perfect catalyst for Foster. As word spread about his plan to organize a black baseball league, there were attempts by the white-run Eastern League of Colored Baseball to buy Foster out. Nat Strong, the founder of the White League, offered Foster a team of his own and the opportunity to play in a $100,000 stadium. Foster turned down the offer because for him, it was about principle. Integration in sports, as opposed to integration at the ballot box or in the public conveyance, was a winning proposition for the whites, who controlled the sports industry complex. They would move to exploit black muscle and talent, thus sucking the life out of the black institutions while at the same time giving themselves credit for being humanitarians. While black bodies dominate on the fields, white people dominate in the administration at every level for every type of sport. Black represents 3.9% of the total number of head coaches in all three divisions. Segregation at the administrative level in sports was and is a protective tariff for whites. Power without heart and strength is meaningless. Kurt Flood was the first player to invoke the comparison of the plantation metaphor in connection with professional athletes that I can remember. At the time, he was probably the best center field in baseball. In 1969, he was traded from St. Louis Cardinal, where he had played since 1958, to Philadelphia. Flood was stunned because he didn't want to be traded. After all, he was still crushing it with his current team. But Jim Tooney, the Cardinals vice president, told Flood that he had been traded. Despite his time and stature in the game, Flood had not been given the courtesy of a call or a warning beforehand. Nothing he was given. He was traded. Just like that. That's how business was done. Athletes of his generation were powerless to determine their fate. They had limited option, but Flood refused to go to Philadelphia. He wrote to then baseball commissioner Bobby Cunn that that after 12 years in a major league, I do not feel that I am piece of property to be bought and sold irrespective of my wishes. But that's exactly what he was. In fact, that's what all athletes were. So many of pieces of property to be bought, sold, or discarded as their owner saw fit. This was and still is allowable in sports because athletes are supposed to be grateful for the opportunity. Flood lost his case against the owners primarily because many of the other athletes would not back him. Many of them admit later that they were just too scared to challenge the owners. The same things happen even today, and we see it with Colin Kaepernick. Major intercollegiate sports today function like a plantation. The athletes perform in an economic atmosphere where everyone except them makes money off their labor. In the revenue-producing sports of football and basketball, athletes are the gold, the oil, the natural resources that make the NCAA engine run and its cash registers ring. This is even heightened when we consider that black people are locked out of these administrative positions where the money is being made. For black people in sports or any other industries to truly advance, we must get to a place where we don't settle for the individual success, but rather use what power we have to remake a system to ensure fairness and the possibility for future success.
All right, family, thank you for watching. If you haven't already, please smash that like button and subscribe to our page. Like I always say, remember to live your best life.